screen. Yeah. Okay. Hello to everybody. So let's continue our morning session and uh sorry Natasha, sorry to interrupt, but this display is uh see, I don't even see my mouse. So oh, now first you got need to see it. Then I minimize this. Then you, you should not minimize it. Remove it. Go there. More. Then I move, video hide panel. video panel and go again. And hide. Uh, Loading meeting control. controls. And now do it. Okay. Great. Perfect. Okay. With that, we continue. Uh, and the next talk is by Sri Raghu from Stanford. And he will tell us about pair density wave order from electron repulsion. You have 40 minutes and then you Great, thanks. All right, thank you for the invitation. It's always great to be back and see old, old friends. And uh, this work is uh, done in collaboration with three very bright young scientists, in particular, Yiming Wu, who's uh, a postdoc who's about to start uh, at Stanford. And we should uh, have a paper out reasonably soon. So let me start by reviewing some familiar notions. Uh, what I'm going to be discussing in my talk is a rare and exotic type of superconductivity that's related to something that was studied long ago, known as FFLO superconductivity. And remember, in a metal with inversion symmetry or time reversal symmetry, Pairing in, a, in the clean limit involves antipodal points on the Fermi surface between K and minus K. Um, and uh, that's the ordinary superconducting state. And we can solve the linearized gap equations and understand basically everything. By contrast, the FFLO state involves pairing not between K and minus K, but there is some net momentum, which I call Q. That's the momentum of the center of mass of the Cooper pairs. And you can see the difference in the linearized gap equation that it involves fermions at K and minus K plus Q. Okay, so there's two types of such pairing. There's the FF state in which delta is a plane wave. And since all observables must be gauge invariant, this state remains translationally invariant. It's just a phase. By contrast, the state of Larkin and of Chinnikov has a modulated uh, density where the order parameter goes like cosine. So I'm going to be focusing on the Larkin of Chinnikov state in my talk. So this state breaks, of course, the U1, as superconductors always do. And it also breaks um, translational symmetry. But so it, it can also break time reversal symmetry, as you see in this picture here where you imagine Zeeman splitting Fermi surface, so that breaks time reversal symmetry. And then you have on top of that, this modulated superconducting state. So a related state to the Larkin of Chinnikov state, so often Larkin of Chinnikov state is accompanied by a uniform superconducting component. If there were no uniform component, uh, this Larkin of Chinnikov state has been named the pair density wave uh, order. Yes, Pierce, you're right. You can think of the Larkin of Chinnikov state as two FF states, e to the IQR and e to the minus IQR, and then you get a cosine out of this. Uh, Andre? So the question was, yes, uh, the Larkin of Chinnikov state also has no Q equals zero, but in terms of mechanism, it usually came from taking a uniform superconductor polarizing it and, uh, uh, and then having both uniform and non-uniform components. Anyway, these are nomenclature. So we now call these things pair density waves. Okay. The beautiful thing is that not only are these rare and exotic, they exist in nature as uh, shown here in this very important result that hasn't been published yet in the group of Abe Pashupati. Um, this is a europium based iron superconductor. And you can see below certain te transition temperature, you can look with your own eyes directly. If you see the gap as a function of position, it's oscillating in space. 
And from that, if you Fourier transform, you can associate a Bragg Bragg like uh, wave vector associated with the superconducting state. And finally, if you look at the coherence peaks as a function of position, they have the spatially uh, modulated form, which is like the Larkin of Chinnikov or pair density wave state. Other promising candidates include these recently studied and actively studied Kagome metals, uh, cesium, vanadium, and antimony, perhaps UTE2. And of course, it's been invoked as being relevant in the cuprates. I don't know if that's true. I think that still remains controversial. Okay, so we're interested in the pairing mechanism of such states. So let me remind you that if you look at the pair susceptibility, which is defined here, uh, B is a pair of fermions. If I look at the, in a translationally invariant system, it only depends on I minus J. If I look at the static piece and Fourier transform as a function of Q, Q would be the center of mass momentum of the pairs. It has the following feature that it's, first of all, a positive definite function. That's important. That'll be invoked in my talk. It's peaked at Q equals zero. The peak at Q equals zero is the celebrated logarithmic divergence of BCS. And uh, shown here in the limit as Q goes to zero, it's just the density of states times some constants involving the cutoff and the temperature. So because the susceptibility is biggest at Q equals zero, that's why uniform superconductivity always wins. And if you want to have a mechanism for Larkin of Chinnikov like pairing, you want to really build on this already large susceptibility at Q equals zero and maybe try to perturb the metal by say a Zeeman field if we're talking about singlet pairing. And so you usually have schematic phase diagrams like this where, whoops. Okay, there we go, still works where you have for a large part of the phase diagram, a uniform superconductor and just a sliver, say if you apply a magnetic field in the regime right near the upper critical field, you might see an FFLO state, okay? But what I wanna do is ask, so this I would call an extrinsic mechanism. It relies on some other order that's about to condense. And this was the strategy I think also of Larkin and of Finco. But what I wanna ask is, is there a more intrinsic mechanism where the, you get naturally a, a spatially modulated superconductivity without the need to invoke a uniform component, okay? And for that, because the susceptibility is not p logarithmically divergent at Q away from zero, we need to go away from this tyranny of weak coupling. We need to get away from weak coupling. So in my talk, I have good news. What we have done is that we found robust low energy effective theories hosting the pair density wave order for a variety of lattice continuum systems in D greater than one. But there's always bad news. The bad news is that the low energy theory requires some special circumstances in order to emerge from microscopic models, like in a solid with the, say the Hubbard model. But I'm an optimistic person. I convert bad news into good news. The fact that it's so rare, so this requires special circumstances, I think explains in part why these states are not found everywhere. It's a rare phase of matter. Okay, so what we study is a Fermi liquid. A Fermi liquid with some dispersion and an interaction, which is a BCS-like interaction. And when this is positive, it's a repulsive BCS interaction. I'm going to study repulsive interactions. In Andre's talk from the other day, Andre also studied repulsive interactions at weak coupling. He showed quite clearly that you have unconventional superconducting states, which are uniform states. But what I'm going to do is go away from the weak coupling limit where we're going to look for non-uniform states. How to solve? We don't have a small parameter, so we're gonna, we're gonna solve using migdal eliasberg theory. Okay, so that does not require being pinned to weak coupling. Yes. Because the logarithmic, oh, sorry, yes. The question is why do we need strong, coupling? strong coupling? We, you know, strong coupling, I just mean you don't, you cannot find it at weak coupling because 
lo the logarithmic physics that gives rise to usual superconductivity is coming from Q equals zero. Away from Q equals zero, the log divergence of the pair susceptibility is cut off. So then you, you need some finite strength. That's not strong coupling, but it's intermediate coupling. It's not, you know, weak or strong is words, but it's not a marginal instability of a Fermi liquid. Nesting is not relevant in this talk. Okay, good. So we're going to solve by migdal Eliasberg theory. And what I mean is this, we have a set of solutions for exact fermion uh, propagator, inverse propagators and exact boson propagator. So where's the boson? The boson will come from the BCS interactions by Hubbard Stratanovich uh, identities. From this, we will introduce a boson, which is actually a collective mode of the fermion itself. It's an intrinsic, it's a, a, an intrinsic property of the fermions. So that defines a bare boson propagator. And we find the exact propagator for the boson. And we find the exact inverse propagator for the fermion. And this is how we solve everything. And from this, the knowledge of the propagators, we extract the physics. So if we want to do thermodynamics, we look at the static pieces of the propagators. If we want to do dynamics, we look at the full propagators, et cetera. Notice for the, for the experts, this is migdal Eliasberg theory in the particle, particle channel, as you can see by the arrows. So we're not doing migdal Eliasberg theory in the particle hole channel the way you would do, say, for the electron phonon problem or other such cases. We are going to start with a BCS interaction and then solve it beyond weak coupling using migdal Eliasberg. Yes, Andre. It, we will find self consistent solutions. Yeah. It doesn't have to be at one loop. Oh, the question the question Andre asks is, is this just self-consistent one loop? In principle, these are fully. Pardon? OK, so maybe this is going to answer your question. If you wish to study a model in which these equations are the saddle point, take the large N action, which is a form of a bosonic piece, a firm, I'm sorry, a fermionic piece, a bosonic piece, and a coupling. And what I'm going to do is take the, a large number of flavors. You've heard lots of talks on this this week. We have a large number of fermion flavors, number of boson flavors, and a coupling, which is in this random Yukawa form. And notice that this is a coupling in the particle-particle channel. So the saddle point is what we solve. And if you say that's one loop self-consistent, then yes, I agree. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Vertex corrections. They are n suppressed. Yeah, in the large at n equals one. We are, we don't compute vertex corrections. The the thing that I will allow for is the possibility of having either attractive or repulsive BCS interactions. So there's a piece that involves psi dagger, psi dagger. There's a piece that involves psi psi, which out of laziness I didn't write, but it has the same form. Um, and the key is that if it's repulsive, there's this coupling is imaginary. If it's attractive, it's real. So we're going to study the repulsive cases. Okay. So the main points of my talk is that repulsive BCS couplings can lead to this pair density wave order. You get long range order when the repulsive forces are actually peaked at finite distance. This is kind of reminiscent of what Andre was talking about in the frequency domain, uh, but this is in, as a function of uh, position. We've solved models with long range order, and then I'm going to speculate on the relevance of this to reality. And we're going to see a phase diagram like this. There's a Fermi liquid, quantum critical point, a long range pair density wave order. There's three regimes in which we solve. In regime one, we just need to solve for the static. I, I told you the, the game is to solve for the exact propagators. Okay. For regime one, when we look at the finite temperature transitions, we only need the static propagators uh, as a function of temperature and momentum. 
and the solution of the linearized gap equations. In region two, when we go into the ordered phase, we need again the static propagators. We can, of course, ignore the fermions. We can integrate out the fermions and look at only the bosonic uh, degrees of freedom in sort of Ginzburg Landau like theory. But in region two, we need to solve for nonlinearities. So uh, as the order parameter develops below TC. And finally, in the quantum critical region, we cannot integrate out the fermions. We need to keep the fermions and the bosons and look for self consistent solutions of the dynamical propagators. Be a fair question to ask if uh, if you uncover your uh, pair uh, your interaction purely in the pairing channel to to tell us what would it presage for any of the uh, normal state response functions as a function of Q. The only response function that enters is the pair, pair susceptibility. So the particle hole. You have not asked, have not asked the other thing. Correct, correct. Good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, in principle, I, I, I know all the physics, but I think what my interpretation of Chandra's question was, do I include interactions in the particle hole channel and look at the renormalization of those things? I'd just like to know what your model implies for normal state response function. Well, in principle, you can calculate at anything. Yeah, as Andre says, from the propagator. But, but you're not going to tell us the answer to that today. I can tell you the answer. We can. Yes, we have thought about it, and I will show you some expressions, especially near the quantum critical point where this is important. But away from this, it's not so important. Okay, first, n equal one, if n equal one, if it's not large n, what would instabilities could happen in strong coupling that will destabilize the pair density wave? Or that's hard to know. I don't know. I cannot speculate. I don't want to speculate. <laughs> I will not speculate. <laughs> okay. So first, let me tell you why the most reasonable thing you would do, short range pair uh, BCS interactions fail, fail for the program. And so what I call that is, as again, an optimistic person, it's a fluctuating but rather actually fa failed pair density wave is the correct approach. So as I said, a form of the bare interactions, was there another question? Oh. The bare interactions that I wish to study determines, sorry, the, the, the interactions I wish to study determines, that defines the bare bosonic propagator, okay? So for instance, if I were studying an exponential form of the, the VIJ, in Fourier space, the bare propagator has this ornstein zernike form, which is just a constant plus Q squared. And then if I solve migdal eliasberg theory, I won't tell you the method. I mean, I won't bear, bore you with details. I'll just tell you the answer. The fully dressed bosonic propagator has a, this Ornstein form plus a self-energy coming from the pair field susceptibility at the static piece, because I'm only looking at finite temperature response at this point. And what you need to know is that for small q, the logarithmic divergence of the pair susceptibility is cut off by omega Debye over V Fermi q. So if you put this together, it's a positive number. This is a positive number. That's a positive number. Everything grows positively. But what you do find is that the solution of the inverse propagator has a minimum at finite q. It's the minimum has gone away from q equals zero because of this logarithmic piece of the pair susceptibility because we're talking about repulsive interactions. Now the Q equals zero piece gets weaker and weaker and weaker. It doesn't grow as it would with attractive interactions. But what you find is that it's peaked at finite Q. Okay, so that's encouraging. That means it would condense if we could just push this down. So for, for those of you who, are, who don't have intuition to think about inverse propagators, let me just say, if I integrate out the fermions, the exact propagator, inverse propagator would be the coefficient of the quadratic term of Ginzburg-Landau theory. And we know that that has to vanish if we have a phase transition. 
And clearly it's positive. That means we're above the phase transition. Even if you go, if you recompute this even at t equals zero, it will always remain positive. Because as I said, the pair susceptibility is a positive function. So we, we fail to capture the pair density wave order in this way. Okay? Yeah. Everything else is just a, uh, so Andre says, what if you go to more accurate order in Q? Yes. 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 Oh, the speed of the speed. Yes. I see. So do you get the C? So the question is, do you get this Q squared term coming from uh, the pair susceptibility or do you have to put it in by hand? Uh, I think you have to put it in by hand. Yes, I don't think it comes. Yes. Okay. So now we want to do something to this model to obtain long range order. And the strategy is to do this. Instead of choosing a, what in physics would say, you should choose something that a uh, BCS repulsion that decreases with position of pair, pairs of tunneling. If you had, however, for whatever strange reason, a non-monotonic uh, BCS interaction, no problem. And intuitively, it's, it's simple why this is the case. Because if I Fourier transform this, I now get already from this, this, uh, this model attraction at finite Q, right? If I Fourier transform this, there's also already attraction at finite Q. Uh, so, but it's still not an instability of the, of the Fermi liquid. We need to increase the interactions beyond some threshold. And then if we do, we will ob obtain a condensation at finite Q. It's very simple. And when it condenses, we will have long range order. So to make things even simpler, because I like models that I can solve exactly and analytically, consider a case where the pair hopping is a delta function. So it's zero, and then it's some number, so a delta function at, at r equals r zero, and then zero everywhere else. So it's a spherical shell, spherical cow, spherical shell approximation. This Fourier transform, of course, is probably, as you all know, is a Bessel function and it has this oscillating pieces. And then when you solve this in the large N, so this defines some bare propagator and we find the exact propagator. What you find is that the exact propagator is this uh, Bessel function, but plus a piece that depends on the pair susceptibility. But now the important thing is that the sign of the interaction matters. So in the, pot, in the regions where it's repulsive in momentum space, the inverse propagator grows. That means the Landau-Ginsberg coefficient gets bigger. But in the regions where it's attractive, it weakens. And so the Landau-Ginsberg coefficient gets smaller. So we're approaching a critical point in the sense. So if you then solve this model, this is the inverse, uh, this is the um, solutions for as you vary the strength of the interaction. So what I'm plotting here is the inverse propagator as a function of Q times R0. You can see that as, at different temperatures, near Q equals zero, first of all, as you lower the temperature, the, um, the inverse propagator grows. That means the coefficient of the Q equals zero piece is increasing. You're getting further away from condensing the Q equals zero boson. But by contrast, at finite Q, where the oscillations in momentum space leads to attraction, you get closer to condensation as you lower the temperature. But you need to increase the coupling. It's not an instability. Beyond some threshold effect, you will get pairing at finite momentum. And it's trivial in some sense. What is the inverse exact static bosonic Green's function. Yes, exactly. So we can proceed in this way and find at different temperatures, where's the temperature dependence coming from? The temperature dependence comes from the pair susceptibility. It has some temperature dependence. 
And so we can obtain a phase diagram by looking at the solutions of the static propagators at different temperatures. And we have a phase boundary between the normal state and the pair density wave state. And the dashed line corresponds to regimes where we cannot compute because at low temperatures, this is a numerical solution of the, uh, the uh, self-consistent equations. And at low temperatures, you have to keep lots and lots of Matsubara frequency. There is a question. Yeah. Uh, from Yuri Yerin. Uh, recently, it was shown by Yusbashian and Ben Schuller in PRB that migdal ili ashberg theory loses validity at finite value of lambda critical between 3, 3 and 3.7 of the coupling regardless of the underlying model Hamiltonian. How it is consistent with your approach? This is particle particle channel. I don't think they analyze this. And anyway, what you, if you wish, take the story that this is the solutions at large n in some large n theory. And uh, that's true for all coupling. <laughs> Probably I didn't answer the question to that person's satisfaction, but let me move on. Okay, so then we can look at the temperature dependence below the phase transition in the pair density wave order regime. And we then have to solve the nonlinear equations and look at self-consistency with the inclusion of the expectation value at finite Q of the boson. And what we see again is indication that the transition is continuous. The order parameter develops uh, smoothly. Again, we have finite size effects. So I don't, I don't, uh, I, I draw that with the dashed line. I wanna show you what we actually compute. We can also determine the ordering wave vector of the pair density wave by looking at the location of in momentum space where the inverse propagator is minimum is a minima actually it has to be zero for the critical point and also at the at the zero it has to have a it has to have a minimum as you approach from the normal state because the propagators must be positive for stability of the theory for the landau ginzburg free energy and so you can determine the ordering wave vector as a function of the coupling constant the dimensionless coupling constant g squared and what I want to say is that it changes with g squared. So you might have thought that you know in this in this problem that I'm solving, the only scale is k Fermi, and so you might have thought that the pair density wave is going to be at two kf. But I want to stress that this is not true. It's sensitive to the interactions, uh, and so two kf is not a characteristic scale in this problem. Also, near this point of ordering, the exact propagator can be. Uh, can the static propagator has this parabolic form as a function of momentum q minus capital Q squared, where capital Q is the ordering wave vector. And this is just obtained by looking at the second derivative of the inverse propagator. So we can do all of these things. Now, everything I told you was for this Dirac delta function, this Bessel function problem. We can also now go back and, you know, as you all know from electromagnetism, you can superpose delta functions and get a realistic potential. So when you do that, you can study a potential like this, which is again, non-monotonic as a function of position, and you get the qualitatively same, I don't want to repeat the whole exercise, but you get similar results. Yes, yeah. Correct. Yeah, the question is, uh, in the model in which there's only one length scale, R0, how is the Q related to R0? So you can see that Q from this from this answer here, uh, Q R zero is its characteristic Q. The characteristic value of Q is one over R zero, as you said, but it changes with G squared. Changes in a modest way. Okay, so we find similar things for a non-monotonic BCS coupling, but also with armed with this in, intuition, we can go and study in in this migdal eli ashberg theory. Lattice models, say where you have a Hubbard model on a square lattice with nearest neighbor hopping and with nearest neighbor repulsive pair hopping. Okay. Now, what we find is again in this Migdal solution where we obtain propagators, when u is less than four times the pair, uh, nearest neighbor uh, pair hopping, and when it's bigger than twice the hopping, you get a pair density wave solutions again. And now the ordering wave vector of this pair density wave is close to pi pi, but it, it depends on the ratio of u over v. And we have not looked at this in full detail, but we know that it's not exactly pi pi. Okay, how am I doing with time? I think I would be done fairly soon, actually. 
Okay, perfect. If there are more questions during the talk, feel free to raise them because I'm I'm wrapping up soon. <laughs> okay. Yeah, please. You mean at zero temperature? Yeah, so, okay, yeah, thank you. The question was, can I tell you a bit more about the phase transition between normal state and pair density wave state at zero temperature or finite temperature? I haven't gotten to the zero temperature part yet, I'm about to do that, but the finite temperature, it's completely conventional, continuous transition, like a Ginzburg-Landau mean field, like transition would predict. Okay, so you have some coefficient of a quadratic term, it's at finite momentum, and that, co and that coefficient vanishes. And then there's a quartic term, which is required for stability. Yeah, yeah, Andre. So the question was, is it a generic statement that when you have this non-monotonic uh, BCS re uh, repulsion, that the system... Can you explain? I mean, the log logarithm is only at zero momentum. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. I don't want to take time from your talk because no, it's you okay. want to talk about zero temperature, but you understand the question. Yes. Yes. And so the question is is it really an extremely generic statement of the same level as Conlatinger did? with um, non S wave. I think it's, I think it still requires that you need to lower the Q equals zero piece. Uh, sorry, the uh, short distance piece relative to the finite distance piece. And I don't think that's always generically guaranteed. It requires special circumstances at the bare level. Yeah. Other questions? All right, so now I'm gonna to go to the zero temperature uh, problem where I go from Fermi liquid to finite Q uh, superconductivity at, across a quantum critical point. And again, let me solve this delta function potential, the somewhat curious, uh, maybe not important, but curious aspect of this, uh, this model is that the critical phenomena of this, uh, this, this problem occurs on a ring in momentum space as opposed to, you know, bosons usually condense at points in momentum space. But this case, if you look at the solutions, the contours of the invert, exact inverse propagator at the static limit, it has this condensation, the zero occurs at a finite momentum radius. Okay, and it's because it's, this is a rotationally invariant problem. There's no uh, characteristic direction in momentum space. So it must be a ring. So if you study this, it turns out that the Fermi surface you can, you can take a point, point on the Fermi surface, scatter with any of these momenta and go to another point in the Fermi surface. So the entire Fermi surface is a hot region. Think of the, the anti-ferromagnetic critical point where you have hot spots, but now we have hot regions, okay? If we were on the lattice, by contrast, you would not have this feature. The condensation would occur at discrete momenta, maybe related by some rotational symmetry, 90 degree rotation. And then you will see the problem of Fermi surface hotspots. Okay, now I know some of you must be seeing this ring of, of, uh, of condensation or, or critical phenomena, and, and you must be thinking, what about fluctuation driven first order transitions a la Brazovsky? Well, the beauty of the large N limit, the Migdal Eliashberg theory, is that it suppresses all of that, all of these important physical effects. And so the, th the transition remains continuous. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
So on this picture, where yeah. is the Fermi wave vector? Oh, it can be uh, something completely different. It's it here as 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 you as was asked. Q depends on R R zero, the range. So it's a different. Uh, it can be different than K F. So arbitrarily the, different. The physics does not depend on the ratio between capital Q and K F. Correct. Well, Q has to be small compared to K F in the regime where we're computing, but beyond that, there's no dependence. Usually, the condensation or uh, those bosons uh, happens into some given single quantum mechanical state. So, can you associate a single wave function with this ring? Because it seems like there are many states characterizing this. Ring. But yeah, but remember, if what happens is that okay, so okay, the question was, what was the question? I, I was going to interpret it in my own way. But the bosons yeah. in state usually yeah. is associated with this quasi single 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 particle yeah. function where where all bosons bosons condense. Yeah. So so now you have a ring which seems to consist of many single particle wave functions. Yes. So yes. What happens, yes. So that can you associate to the condensate a single yes. wave function of yes. this ring? Yes. Or how does it? So the okay. So the question is, can you associate with the condensate? find a, a single wave function or a, a linear combination of infinite number. The answer is the critical phenomena occurs on a ring. That doesn't mean the condensation occurs on the ring. So because we have in Ginzburg-Landau theory, there will be quartic terms and that will choose among this, this uh, degenerate manifold, some discrete subset, and then you'll be safe. Huh? Five minutes, perfect. <laughs> okay, so we can solve Again, in this Migdal approach, the propagators at the quantum critical point. Now we cannot get rid of the fermions as I've been doing before to look at just the bosonic problem. We have to keep the fermions on, uh, uh, in, at play. And then if in the limit where the ordering vector Q is small compared to K Fermi, we can obtain analytically the bosonic and fermionic propagators. And the bosonic propagator takes this form here. I've defined gamma for you. It's the second derivative of the inverse propagator at capital Q. And then there's the Landau damping form, which looks similar to, you can calculate this quite easily. Uh, it looks quite similar to the Landau damped form of the anti-ferromagnetic order parameter with the uh, denominator capital Q. Then the inverse fermion green function has a self energy, which can also be computed. It has this omega, uh, mod omega to the power one half. Uh, form. And the thing is, this is a self consistent result because if you go back and compute, recompute the bosonic propagator, the Landau damping does not change once you include the self energy, and then you can feed back and everything is self consistent. Okay. In the lattice model, this form of self energy would still apply, but only at the hotspots. So this is very similar to the anti ferromagnetic quantum critical point. Um, and so we, we, we can understand the quantum critical. So that's the second part of, the, of this uh, transition. Now, it turns out we're in two dimensions and the dynamical exponent determined by the bosonic Landau damping is two. So what, you're, where you're, what you have here is a problem where you're near the, at the upper critical dimension. And so the uh, critical exponents up to logarithmic corrections to scaling laws will be mean field exponents. So we know that Z is two, and we know that nu is a half for mean field theory. And so the line of thermal transitions call, uh, terminating at the quantum critical point comes in with slope one up to logarithmic corrections because nu Z is one. Okay, I'm done with the analysis. Now, now let me speculate, okay, based on what I've done. Okay, so now everything I say, everything I've said thus far is not controversial, but now everything I will say is controversial. Well, the first thing is not controversial. It's that I've shown you that you need, if you have finite repulsive BCS couplings, which are monoton non-monotonic, you get pair density waves. Great. Unfortunately, this is not common in solids. Okay. Usually, moreover, BCS interactions, hopping of pairs on a lattice, are microscopically known to be small. Okay. But that's microscopic physics. At the level of a low energy effective theory, anything's possible. For instance, let me speculate where you can get this non-monotonic behavior. Suppose I have screen Coulomb interaction and strong 
electron phonon coupling, local electron phonon coupling, which as you know, in the strong coupling limit, you get an instantaneous non-retarded uh, attraction mediated by the phonon. And if that short distance attraction can be sizable, you can, obtain, you can be in a regime where this effective interaction is non-monotonic. And I think this might explain in part some recent density uh, DMRG simulations done by the group of, of Steve Kibbelson and his students, where they found pair density wave order in some Hubbard Holstein models and strong coupling. Maybe this, this physics is somewhat you know, reminiscent of what they found. The other thing I want to say is that I alluded to the fact that pair density wave order has been observed in these Kagome metals, uh, cesium, vanadium, antimony. Now, near the Van Ho filling is where they're seen. My uh, friend, Ronnie Kamali, made an important observation a few years ago that when you look at fermions near the Van Hove singularity, you have a hexagonal Brillouin zone, and you can approximate the fermions dominantly coming from points, patches near the Van Hove singularity. And they have this property known as what he called sub-lattice interference, that the wave functions all, all belong to one out of the three members of the real space sub-lattice of the Kagome lattice. So that what that means is that, that if you look at the states here, they all belong to the A sublattice, B sublattice, and C sublattice. So now what we want to do is we want to look at, uh, in this patch-like theory, the renormalization starting with sub-Hubbard interaction, the renormalization of the BCS repulsion, maybe as Andre mentioned in many examples in his talk, the interpatch patch uh, BCS coupling can be bigger than the intra-patch, and then you would be exactly in this regime where the pair density wave order can form. Okay, so I think I should stop here. This is the summary in the form of a picture. And thank you for all the questions and your attention. Thank you very much for the talk. More questions? So for the pair density wave, do you need non-monotonic interaction or just any interaction that give a negative when you Fourier transform to moment of space, a negative component? The latter. Okay. Yeah. And so a real world question about uh, Kagame's. Yes. Uh, if you're going to have uh, the PDW physics that people are talking about in the Kagame's, does that come along with a fundamentally unconventional order parameter that should, for instance, be disorder sensitive? Not necessarily. No. It can come, come along with a uniform S wave component. So here, everything I was doing was a sort of a, 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 the pairs consisted of fermions on the same site. So it would be, a, well, I mean, the pair density wave, of course, is very sensitive to disorder. But the, if it were accompanied with a uniform S wave component, there's no problem. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, perhaps I could ask you to push your speculation even further, please. Yeah. Uh, there are a number of experiments, particularly, for example, Seamus Davis, where you see pair density waves with their scanning tunneling microscopy, but they also see superconductivity. Can you comment on whether the pair density wave is just a spectator or an active participant there? <laughs> I told you I was going to push you. Um, probably a spectator, I would say. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, this notion that it's the mother of all facts I don't necessarily subscribe to. So it, it might, it might, you know, it might be a small fraction of something that is on top of a uniform component. That's my speculation. Of course, I could be wrong. So that's sure. what I think. And, and I guess following up on my previous question, since I have the microphone, um, when I asked you about the transition between Fermi liquid to pair density wave, I guess my real question was, what would be the observable characteristic of that transition? Observable characteristic. characteristic of the Fermi liquid to pair density wave transition. Finite temperature or zero? Yes, finite temperature. Well, so you would see uh, if you do x ray uh, scattering, you would yes. see a Bragg peak that would grow okay. at a, uh, below, below TC, and the Bragg peak, the Bragg you know, gets sharper as, okay. as you lower the temperature. So, you, you know, just like a charge density wave order. Okay, but how would you distinguish it from the charge density wave? Because of the resistance. The resistance oh, is zero. Okay, so you have to do transport as well as. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Other questions?
It's one like conceptually don't have to translate. The pairs have a translational. So the question Chandra said was pairs don't couple to x-rays, but with every pair in the at finite Q, there's an accompanying charge density wave component, which is uh, always present just by symmetry. Twice the Q. Yes. So you would see the ordering at, uh, you would see the Bragg peaks at twice the Q. Yeah. Actually, uh, particularly as the last example, but it's uh, one whole point, right? Uh, in, in your case, and in the case that in many situations leads to non S wave pairing from initial repulsive interaction, you start with initial repulsion and then dress up pairing interaction. Right. In your case, you basically you add corrections in a particle particle channel. Yes. Uh, and but you have Q square, as you said, yes. coming from somewhere. Yes. yes. Uh, on the other hand, if you add renormalization in the particle whole channel, you get you did it by yourself. Uh, you get effective attraction in non S wave channels. At Q so equals zero. At Q equal to zero. Yes. 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 So, question is there are two competitors, right? Yes. So, yes. it's just one possibility or the other. Yes. Yes. If you don't include this Q squared piece, you could. But, you know, in the large N limit, this cone Luttinger, all these diagrams are one over N suppressed. You made it. You made them. I, I did it by hand. But, of course, as N goes to one, I. What I envision is that what I call Fermi liquid in the left side of the phase diagram here will maybe be some unconventional superconducting state, and they might be a phase transition from one Q equals zero superconducting state to a Q finite superconducting state. And maybe that's first order because mm -hmm. that's what Landau would tell us. But that's a speculation. So, uh, I don't see any other questions. Oh, Excuse me. The fourth oh, floor would like to ask some questions. I've had my hand up for 10 minutes. Sorry, I didn't see that. Okay, um, uh, a number of questions. First of all, um, what about triplet pair density waves? Did you think about that? Yeah, yeah, I did think about that. And uh, quite similar things can be arranged in the triplet case. And actually there might be regimes where the uh, pair hopping can be somewhat more natural than the ones I, I, I used because they were on-site Cooper pairs. If you have bond Cooper pairs that's as you must in the triplet channel uh, then then similar mechanisms can play also and uh follow up um yeah uh, there's some overlap between these ideas and those of amperian pairing um and uh, did you look at any uh did you examine that possibility the possibility that that there might be models that stabilize pairing at uh, 2kf this would be interesting because it would somehow mix particles and holes with the same velocity rather than yeah. opposite velocities um yeah. uh, did you think about that yes i thought a lot about this uh amperian pairing is an appealing scenario but uh, i don't think it was found in any uh calculational framework so uh, ba basically i did think about this and we never found Ampere in pairing. This is, I mean, it's the, it's the right country, it's France, but it's Coulomb, not Ampere. Uh, that's what I would say. Uh, second of all, um, if you do study more exotic metals like Fermi surface coupled to some U1 gauge field, then you can have a situation in which there's a repulsive BCS coupling like the ones I'm discussing here. But then the system has an IR fixed point, which is a non-Fermi liquid. And then you can have Ampere in pairing solutions um, but again, we never analyze, we never could find them, at least in the, the way we were doing these calculations. So I should. Thanks very much. Sure. sure. Uh, it would be great if they did occur, though. I agree with you. Yes. So, uh, so you did all this without um, bringing in any effect of uh, nesting, uh, but fermi I, surface I, nesting. Yes. Yes. But yes. if I understand correctly then the Q, the, the capital Q that you have corresponds to a very large um, distance over which the, the interaction is modulated. Could you uh, possibly be able to derive that from um, incommensurate charge density or some nesting phenomena? I don't think so. I mean, I think this is not a weak coupling phenomena where I have to couple points exactly on the Fermi surface. Once you go away from weak coupling, you can have 
you know, some window about the Fermi surface coupling to another window. So it's not tied to any nesting effects. And that's what we find in this model as well. Yeah. Uh, did I correctly understand? Did I correctly understood that you have a Yukawa coupling between bosonic modes? Yes, uh, between a boson and a fermion. Okay, so um, a charge two e boson and a fermion. fermion. So how much does it depend on these results on this averaging? Did if you would compute just for a simple G tensor? Uh, have you tried to to look into what? That? What do you mean by simple G tensor? Like this coupling between fermions and bosonic modes. If you don't randomize on them, but you choose a simple form for. Well, then, uh, okay, so you could do that, but then you're not sol solving exactly migdal eliasberg equations. So I would say I only invoke this uh, because I want to, for those who insist on ha having a model, this is the model whose saddle point is migdal eliasberg But let me just say, I'm thinking about migdal eliasberg Yeah, just I wonder, I mean, for, for yeah. real material in the end, it will be kind of something fixed. You know? Yeah, so there are issues with this random Yukawa model. There, you know, it's very multi-critical and you know there's other subtleties that I didn't want to get across here so let me just say that uh, you know for for the finite temperature transitions this model is perfectly adequate and so since the physics is robust you could probably do other large n expansions and find similar behavior as well. but at, Q, at the quantum critical point is subtle there's I think Andre has it or are we done or of course Thank you. Uh, I want to make a very small comment. Uh, you used the word migdal Eliasberg many times today. Yes, yes. You are at finite temperature. You deal with static poles. Yes. Migdal Eliasberg. Quantum critical a, point. You. No, no, no. Yeah. Migdal Eliasberg is the idea that you have fast electron and slow boson. Here you have a static boson. So it's definitely not migdal Eliasberg <laughs> in this respect. So I would prefer, I suggest to call it self-consistent one loop or large N uh -huh. something, but not something that has a concept of one excitation slower than the other, because you, well, at finite temperature, zero temperature is a different story. Yes. But at finite temperature, since you deal with static boson, yes. then there is no such thing as comparing of velocity. Well, at finite temperature, there's also a, there can be smooth analytic dynamical pieces that don't matter. Right, they don't matter. This is what I mean. So yeah, they don't in matter. This respect, uh, it's not migdal Eliasberg because it doesn't use this concept of, of frequency. Uh, of, yes, of one excitation I much faster than the other. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's a good, good point. Thank you. Thank you. So let's thanks Shri again. Thank you. And uh, lunchtime, so we reconvene at two o'clock. Do I just turn it off?